My next guest is someone who brings hope and inspiration to the show. She is one out of every 10 women in America who suffer, unfortunately, from endometriosis, far more common than so many of us realize. She's also an author. She's the founder of Know Your Endo. She wrote another book, One Part Plant, and the follow-up. Her second book is actually called Know Your Endo as well, and I can't think of anybody better to talk about this, to share her incredible story, bring hope, bring inspiration to the exam room than Jessica Mernan. Thank you so very much for being here, Jessica. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Your voice is so smooth. I just, I love listening to it. <laughs> <laughs> I got my song, I, I got my start in media producing love songs. So maybe that's where the, yes. where the smoothness comes from. It must from. be, it must be. <laughs> well, congratulations on the release of your book. This is just a, a fantastic read. And I will tell you as a guy, um, it has been really interesting since we've been talking about endometriosis here on the show for the better part of a couple of years now, um, especially with Dr. Bernard as well. Mm -hmm. um, just learning about all of this stuff from a, a woman's perspective, how important is it that their male partners really kind of understand yeah. what it is that you all are going through? Yeah. And I, and I don't even think it's just male partners. I think it's any partner. I think it's friends. I think it's family. I think it's everyone in our lives. And it's so important because I think that with endometriosis, it's a full body condition. It's, it's not just painful periods. It affects our careers, our relationships, our mental health. So it's incredibly important. And I think with endo, we get very, very good at pushing through and not asking for help. So I think that if we can also ask for help and accept help, I think it becomes a lot easier too. Uh, yeah. I mean, asking for help is something that a lot of people struggle with. Do you th Why is it, especially with this and in, in this condition, is it that so many people feel like they need to just kind of plow through it and deal with it? on their own and, and be isolated about it? Well, I mean, I think there's a, a few reasons. One, I think we're taught not to talk about our periods. They're gross. They're weird. Only women have them. So I think that from a young age, we're talk, taught not to talk about it. And second, I think that with endo, it impacts us every single month and throughout the month. So I think that for myself, I got really good at like, I can't complain about this every day. Like fatigue is a huge issue for people with endo. <clears throat> and it feels, I don't know, you don't want to seem like a complainer. You don't want to seem, <clears throat> and I also think you don't want to focus on it so much, right? Like you want to live your life. So I think a lot of us just push through. It's like, well, there's nothing I can do about this. So I just need to to plow through it, like you said. Yeah. Well, let's dive into your story. Let's let's offer some hope and inspiration so yeah. that somebody listening to this right now who is suffering in silence knows that they are not alone. Let's give them some tools to to overcome. And let's start with that inspirational part. I, I use that word a lot because, uh, I mean, I just love the story so much that are shared on this show. And, and yours is just going to be another one. And, and it's just incredible. So I want to hear from you about when you first started to notice some of these symptoms creeping in? When did you first notice that something was not quite right? Yeah. And I love that you say symptom because I think symptom awareness with endo is one of the most important things that we can talk about because so many of the symptoms are unrelated to our period. So, you know, I had the whole list of symptoms. I had fatigue, GI issues, urinary issues, painful sex, painful periods. And so <clears throat> it's interesting because my mom also had significantly horrible periods, horrible fatigue, urinary issues, GI issues. So I wasn't even on a journey to get a diagnosis because I just thought that is the norm. When a woman has her period, she is in debilitated pain and that's the norm. So I definitely noticed these symptoms on my first period, but I didn't think that it was out of the norm to have these symptoms. So a lot of people with endo will notice that from their first period, from the first or second year of having their period, they're experiencing these things. It's it's not something that all of a sudden, I think like some, are, some other chronic illnesses where you develop it when you're 
30 or 40, this is generally starting from the jump of a period. Did you talk about this at all with your friends? I know that we just mentioned like suffering in silence, but I found that when I was younger, at least like we, my group of friends, we overshared everything. And so I'm just curious, like at that younger age, was this anything that you, you spoke about with your friends? No, because I just thought that this was normal. Mm. Like I just, I normal for me. Right. And, and I, it's, it's interesting because I was talking about this with someone the other day and I was a curvy girl I was, you know, definitely called chubby a lot at school. And so I thought maybe this is just another thing that is different about me. Maybe this is another thing that maybe I would be made fun of for. And I just thought it was something that was unique to myself. And I did actually have a friend in high school that had really bad periods too. And so I'm like, oh, okay. So my best friend has really bad periods. My mom has really bad periods. This is normal. Mm, you brought self-esteem into it. That's oh my gosh. That's uh, yeah. Let's explore that. I mean, <clears throat> so you're in high school, and you, I mean, that's that's insecurity central right there. And so you add this on top of it. What did this do to your self-esteem? Well, you know, what's interesting is it wasn't until I really wrote this book that I, I've really struggled a lot with body dysmorphia since high school, and it really wasn't until I wrote this book that I started to connect the body dysmorphia to my endo more because when you're, you know, with endo, you definitely a lot of times have that extended, distended belly. You have a lot of inflammation. And so I writing this book, I'm like, Oh, like when you're asked if you're pregnant every day, because you wear anything remotely fitted, if you feel so uncomfortable in your body because it's so inflamed, because it's so bloated, of course you're going to start having distorted views of yourself. So when you say that self-esteem, I mean, it was huge and not just the, phys the physicality of it, but bleeding through your pants in high school and having to tie a jean jacket around your waist as you walk through the hallway and hoping no one notices and having GI issues, having to go to the bathroom all the time. Like these are things that you're, you know, even as adults, some people are very embarrassed about it. Think about doing that in high school. My gosh. I can't even imagine. <clears throat> Did you beg your parents to stay home when you were having your period? Because that just does not sound like any fun whatsoever. <laughs> well, I mean, my mom would always, I mean, she came and picked me up generally on the first couple of days of my period. And we didn't even discuss it because, again, we thought that that was normal. Well, let's talk about how things progressed for you. Did your symptoms worsen as you grew a little bit older? Did they get a little bit worse maybe as you graduated high school, went into college, and then moved on? Yeah, I mean, they definitely got significantly worse. And I think, you know, with endo, depending on where your lesions are growing, depending if you have ovarian cyst, depending on if you have endometriomas, which are called chocolate cysts that are full of blood, I mean, yes, it, it did significantly get worse for me and it got to the point, you know, and still let's, let's also, I want to remind you, I was never diagnosed yet either. So I didn't know that I even had endometriosis mm -hmm. and it wasn't until that I had a couple of cysts rupture and had to go to the ER multiple times that I finally found a doctor that said, Hey, maybe we should look into this because prior to that, I had complained about all of the hallmark endo symptoms, painful sex. A doctor told me that I needed to relax more in bed, GI issues. Maybe you have IBS, urinary issues. You need to drink more water. So I was being misdiagnosed and misdiagnosed for years and it did get significantly worse. Well, that's interesting that you were misdiagnosed when it is such a, a common thing. I, you know, I, I mean, I'm listen, <laughs> The amount of people that <clears throat> have been misdiagnosed with IBS, sexually transmitted disease, cancer. I mean, it, when I share these stories with people, they're like, no, ask any person with endo and I will, they will most likely tell you they've been diagnosed with something else. Incredible. So you're so young and you're going through this and you, still you, you're thinking that it's normal, but what was this doing to your quality of life? So you talked about the embarrassment of having to cover your pants with a jean jacket, but mm -hmm. you're young. I mean, you have all of these things to go to like football games on Friday night, homecoming, prom, 
you know, just time with your friends. Like, what was this doing to your quality of life? Well, it did help that I was sort of an alternative goth kid and hated anything that had to do with <laughs> being popular. But, but I, it, you know, I, I, it, it definitely changed. And I think this is why symptom awareness is so important to me. I actually go, you know, pre-COVID, I would go to high schools to to talk to young women about these are the symptoms of endometriosis. Because if I would have known that those symptoms were a cause of something else, it would have changed my world in college, in starting my career in my 20s. So yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to say how it impacted me because that was just my norm. It's the only thing that I knew. I would have never pegged you as a goth girl at all. <laughs> you, you you do not give off that aura whatsoever. Um, my you goodness. know, I had the, the bangs cut to here. I hung out with, you know, girls with shaved heads and black. We wore lots of fishnets. <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay. We're, we're learning. We're learning today. Goodness gracious. Um, what we haven't talked about yet, though, is what your diet was like at this point. That's another thing that yeah. I've discovered over the course of the last two years when this has come up on the show is mm -hmm. how intricately this can be linked to what it is that we're putting into our body. Yeah. I mean, I, I write so much about this in my first book. I mean, I grew up just like most Midwesterns, lots of meatloaf. My mom made this thing called hamburger pie, which was a layer of meatloaf, a layer of mashed potatoes, a layer of cheese and a layer of ketchup, which makes me kind of want to vomit a little bit thinking mm. about eating that now. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was very standard American diet. And <clears throat> after high school, going into college, I mean, you know, I was working two jobs, working at a pizza place at night. So it was a lot of pizza, a lot of fast food. And even after college, I never cooked. So it's whatever was frozen I could find, whatever was, I loved candy. I had candy pretty much every day of my life. So whatever was convenient. And I even, I write in my Know Your Endo that I loved convenience food, meaning it was convenient and you could find it at a convenience store. Yeah. Oh boy. Welcome to America. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, and you know, I want to be clear, I'm not shaming anyone for eating that way because I think, you know, it's whether it's your budget or what you have access to or how you grew up. Like some of us don't know the power of food until we try the power of food. Oh, I think the majority of us don't know the power of food because we are brought up on these ultra processed, ultra convenient foods, whether it's from a drive through or 7-Eleven or even the majority of your grocery store. Um, right, you right. know, it's it's just unbelievable how much we lean on, on those kinds of foods. Um, one person who I spoke to previously um, who really battled endometriosis badly, she said that cheese was really, really the hardest thing for her, not just to give up, but she suspects that that was also a huge, huge, huge driving factor for her condition, perhaps more so than any other food. Was that a big one for you too? Oh my gosh. Cheese was my most favorite food. Um well, I think and we can look at it as as we know, and you probably have talked about many times in this podcast, is dairy is a huge inflammatory. So if you have an inflammatory condition and endometriosis is a hugely highly inflammatory condition, when you add dairy, I mean, you're adding fuel to that fire. So I ate a lot of dairy. I ate a lot of pizza. I ate a lot of fondue. I mean, <laughs> name anything with dairy and I could find it and eat it. So yeah, I definitely think, you know, I haven't had dairy for 10 years now. And I know now, I mean, that was a huge trigger for me GI wise, for sure. All right. So when did you first start putting the dots together that, well, maybe it is that dairy, maybe it's that hamburger pie that's playing a role <laughs> in all yeah. of this. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that tricky thing is, is with food, you know, we can't stop endo from growing. We cannot make it go away. So, you know, with me and food, those low inflammatory foods and you know, it wasn't until I was faced with a hysterectomy and a friend of mine sent me a link to a website that talked about how a lower inflammatory diet and a plant-based diet could help. And, you know, this is before there were podcasts like yours and there was a lot of information out there about this, or there was, but it was definitely not as accessible. 
<clears throat> and so when she sent me this link, I thought there is no possible way that I'm going to try this and there is no possible way it's going to work. But I thought, you know, I'm going to get this hysterectomy anyway. And my friend sent this to me. So I'll try it for a few weeks, see what happens. And it worked. I mean, I, <clears throat> excuse me, my pain started to fade. And, and again, like I like to be so clear that it did not stop my endometriosis from growing. But what it did do is it allowed me to get out of bed and it allowed me to move my body again. And it allowed me to be a little bit less depressed that this endo was just really, truly destroying my life. And so food to me was that first tool that just cracked open my head into exploring other tools to manage my endo. So you're talking about a hysterectomy. That is a <clears throat> major, major, major procedure. And you mm -hmm. still look so young. I mean, you're talking about you've been eating a plant-based diet for a decade now. But so, I, I mean, you're just so young. And that's such a massive decision and will have major ramifications for the rest of your life. What were the emotions that went through uh, your head with that? I, given the gravity of the situation and how young you were. I mean, I think when you were in the darkest time of your life and truly, I don't want to start crying, but like, don't want to wake up in the morning and do love your life, but don't want to be alive. A hysterectomy feels easy. It felt like if I, if I could get this and I could not be in this pain and in this dark place, that it's worth it to me. And, you know, I didn't also know back then that there's a lot of people with endo that get a hysterectomy because there are so many medical websites still to this day that say a hysterectomy is a treatment for endometriosis. But if you are removing the uterus and you are not excising the endometriosis inside the body, it, you're still going to be in pain. And I didn't know this back then. So, yeah, I mean... I also knew from a very young age that I didn't want pregnancy for my body. And I always say, I don't know if there was some sort of endo angels looking out for me that knew something that I didn't know about my fertility, but I was okay with the kid thing. But yeah, I mean, it was scary to think about going into menopause in my thirties. Like that's terrifying. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I did not know that, uh, that the hysterectomy was not the, the cure all for it. No, um, it's not. And it's so... The two the huge misconceptions are that hysterectomies are the end-all, be-all treatment for endo. Pregnancy is a treatment for endo, which is just the most – I can't even describe how upset that makes me when pe doctors tell people that. in the pill and hormones, those are not treatments for endo. So in, in your estimation, I mean, when you began to eat this, this healthier diet, um, mm -hmm. and, and you obviously did not wind up having the operation. Um, you know, you said that it did not take very long for you to begin to feel better. How mm -hmm. surprised were you by this? I, mean, I was shocked, but also mad too. Like this works <laughs> you know, like, like, because it's, because I think that, you know, I cried about changing my diet for at least the first few months. And I think that's the thing that I think that when you hear success stories and you hear amazing things like on your podcast about the power of food, it's just like, oh, I tried this diet and it worked. And then, no, it was hard. It sucked for a very long time because A, I didn't know how to cook. B, I felt like my endo was taking away something else from me. And, and I was very upset about it. But when you see that and feel that it's working – you can't deny it. So then you have to sort of say, all right, buck up, figure out how to cook, find food you love, and let's do this. It can be kind of daunting for those of us who did eat that ultra processed, ultra convenient diet like you were talking about to go to a more plant-based diet where you do have to rely more on your culinary skills in the kitchen. Um, I, I So you're talking about endo taking something away from you. And mm -hmm. that brings me back to the relationship that we have with food. During these times when you were in pain and you felt so sick, did you ever turn to food as a comfort, not knowing, I mean, obviously not knowing that it was part of why you were in such crippling pain? Oh my gosh. I mean, I have huge disordered eating issues and I mean, candy, 
was my best friend. For, <laughs> I mean, it's, I mean, it's sad, but I mean, I, I definitely turn to food all the time as a coping, coping mechanism. And I think even if you are eating an amazing, healthy plant-based diet, that doesn't necessarily stop you from using food to cope either. So I guess somebody now may be watching or listening to this and they're like, okay, well, she was able to go from that, you know, grab and go diet to spending time in the kitchen. She learned how to cook. Let's try to give them some tips to walk them into that themselves yeah, because it, sure. it can be overwhelming. So what are some of the first things that you did to really become more comfortable in the kitchen? Well, and I, I share this in one part plant, but I mean, truly the first like month I ate a corn tortilla with salsa on top because that's all I knew how to make <laughs> because I just, I, when people tell me they cannot cook, I don't give them a pass on that because I am someone that could not cook either. I couldn't even make a pan, a pot of rice without burning it. So I think what I would tell everyone to do that I wish I would have done find recipes that actually sound good to you, which I know sounds like duh, but I think that we see all of these plant-based healthy recipes online. It's like, I didn't want to eat steamed broccoli and brown rice. I wanted to have lasagna. So where is the lasagna that I can eat? And I have a really good lasagna in my, in my um, cookbook. One, finding recipes you like. Two, make them easy. You do not need to make like a 20 layer tiramisu situation. You can make three ingredient energy balls. Find things that don't take a lot of time. Like if you don't love cooking or you're not sure how, find 20 minute or less recipes. I, I think that we just think that we have to romanticize and, you know, make it we're the next Julia Child. Like, no, like get in, get out. Like I watch Netflix a lot while I'm cooking. I will talk to a friend. I listen to podcasts. I don't necessarily love to cook all the time, but I love how it makes me feel. And I love the fact that you referenced three ingredient energy balls. That was one of the first things my <laughs> wife and I learned as well. I, those things are amazing. Yes. Yes. And like, I think that's the thing is like, we think that we have to go just like full force because we see people on Instagram that have for some reason all the time in the day to make all of these things. And it's like, no, make it easy. Absolutely. Absolutely. We do tend as, as humans to overcomplicate everything. I mean, that's just kind of like human nature. And I love the KISS philosophy, you know, keep it simple, stupid, right? right? So, you know, like, let's just not reinvent the wheel. Let's go with what you know. Let's find those three ingredient recipes. And oh, by the way, you will find out that they are absolutely fantastic. Fantastic. It's unbelievable how good some of these things are. Yeah. And one more tip that I love so much, which is really so much of one part plant is I talk about having your top 10 pantry staples. I have my top 10 because when I first went to the grocery store, I freaked the frick out because I'm like, there's so I don't know what to buy. So now I know if I have veggie broth, nut butter, a little maple syrup, some tamari, some nutritional yeast. Like I have my top 10 that I know if I have those things and some vegetables, I can make something in 20 minutes or less. And when I run out of one of those top 10s, I make sure that it's stocked right away. Yeah. I, you mentioned maple syrup. So what are you doing now to satisfy that sweet tooth? You were a candy candy junkie there. Um, <laughs> what are you doing to satisfy the, the sweet tooth now and, and not uh, you know be doubled over in pain? Well, I so I in Know Your Endo, I include a recipe that I wasn't quite sure if my editor would let me include it because it's called a cup of something. A cup <laughs> and of it's something. Too... <laughs> okay, so it is a cup. <laughs> it is a cup of a scoop of almond butter, a couple drops of maple syrup, a drop or two of oats, a drop of vanilla a little bit of salt, you mix it all together. It's kind of like a cookie dough bite. And I was making these a lot at home. And my husband's like, are you getting a cup of something again? And I'm like, I'm getting a cup of something. So I think it's just, you know, is it Sour Patch Kids? No, but a cup of somethings, you know, they don't make me feel so bad after. I love that. <laughs> what is that? I don't know. It's a cup of something. Like that is fantastic. Oh my God. I love that so much. And it's so simple. It's yeah. So 
Try. I'm like, excited for you to try it tonight. You could add in a little cacao nibs or dark chocolate. Like you just kind of make it your own little cup of something. Oh, I'm going to have a <laughs> cup of something here. <laughs> And we're going to have a cup of something. And I'll tell you what, it's going to be something. It's going to be amazing. That's what it's going to be. I love that so much. And like, so you get creative and and you're feeling better. And I think that like one thing probably, you know, led to another, like you started to feel better physically, you, you get more comfortable in the kitchen. And before you know it, like you're leading this completely different life, I would imagine. Yeah. And you know, I am leading a completely different life, but I, I, I do think it's also important to note, I still get cramps sometimes. My endo is not perfect at all times. I still sometimes have GI issues, but I am out of bed. I am moving my body. I am able to function within the world, be with my family and friends. And so I think what's so important with endometriosis is to really look at redefining or defining what your best is with endo. It's not what someone else's best is without endo. It's maybe not even someone's best with endo that's your friend. It's your best. And I think it's so important to remember where we've been and where we are now. It might not always be perfect, but if you can have more, I like to say, if you can have more good days than bad, like you are winning with endo. Yeah, I uh, thank you so much for the the realism there. Um I I do worry sometimes that people's expectations with these kinds of things are a little bit higher um mm -hmm. than than what reality may actually wind up being, but if we could quantify the improvement that you've seen. So like on, on a pain scale, say previously you were at a 10 out of 10 in terms mm -hmm. of pain, where would you say on those bad days, those bad days that you do have now, where would you put yourself on that scale? Gosh, I mean, I, I definitely more of a four. I mean, and I mean, to me, a four or five is huge. And, and I think it's, you know, what type of symptoms are we looking at? Because no, I'm not on the, and I'm telling you, it was on the bathroom floor, not able to get, pick myself up from the bathroom floor crying versus, you know, having some cramps and being so fatigued that I have to cancel a meeting. But to me, having to cancel one meeting is much better than not being able to pick myself up from the bathroom floor. So it's huge improvements for me. Absolutely. As you said, just getting out of bed is is just a, you know, it's a thing. That yeah. That's more than a cup of something. That's that's <laughs> awesome. Is That's what that is. Um, I guess let's kind of take it in a different direction. So we've talked a little bit about diet here mm -hmm. and the role that that has played. But another thing that you uh, cover in the book is stress management. Mm -hmm. How important have you, how important is that, would you say, in your overall recovery or management of endo? Oh my gosh, it's huge. And I mean, as we have seen the research and studies show that increased stress can increase pain, right? So endo in itself can always already be stressful. I think that we get stressed out about you know, not being there for our family and friends, not being able to go to work, like not being able to function. So it's stressful in itself. And then tack on the stress of the world and we're completely stressed out. So in the book, I talk a lot about stress management and really show some of that, that research that, that is supporting it. But I also think it's important to note that I'm not talking about having to meditate twice a day, if that's not your thing. Like for me, stress management is doing jigsaw puzzles. It's taking a walk without a podcast or music, just being able to really have a mindful walking experience. It's saying no to things that I don't want to do. So I think we can really introduce different types of stress management and not necessarily having to pay to go to an expensive meditation retreat for two weeks. I think that you just hit on the holy grail of recovery, no matter what the condition is. And, and I'm dead serious. So people ask me a lot about weight loss and and like, what is the key to to doing it and keeping it off and, and staying on that healthier track long term? And I always tell them, I was like, it's about finding what works for you. There yes. is no one size fits all for everybody. And when you do find something that works for you, like it is just like the the heavens above are shining mm -hmm. down on you and and finally everything clicks into place and they're like well how do i find that like how does somebody find that from your experience how do you convey that to to somebody yeah well i mean in the book i you know we talk about 10 different types of stress management i mean like i mentioned jigsaw puzzles are one that i really love i i think it's you know really start to exploring 
what is your body attracted to? Like, what is your mind attracted to? What do you do after? And you're like, huh, wow, I feel a little bit better because, you know, we, we have seen some research and studies show that people that have been through significant long-term stress and have significant unresolved trauma, sometimes meditation can actually bring more anxiety to them. It can make them feel more stressful because of those breath patterns. So if you are feeling anxious and do not feel good meditating, don't meditate. No matter how many people tell you how great meditation is, find something that feels good for you. And I I always love to tell people to, to go back and think about what they love doing as a child. Is it coloring? Is it just jumping on a trampoline outside? Like I think that we can kind of tap into things that we might not think about that brought us joy now, but like what brought us joy before we had all the stress that we have? Absolutely. That is so well put. And one of the things that I I also tell people, I was like, look, you know, you don't, ha- there is no one size fits all, but there's a lot of good advice out there. So if, if you hear something that might be of interest of, uh, to you from one person, you take that. And then mm-hmm. you, there's something over here and you take that. And oh, there's some more over here. Let me take a couple of helpings of that. And so you're not reinventing the wheel per se, but you're mm-hmm. putting together your own unique wheel. And then it's the best wheel for you. And that's how you really get the opportunity to move forward in the best light possible, feeling the best way possible, setting yourself up for success long term because you've built something that is your own while still not reinventing the wheel. So it's not quite as daunting of a task as people realized. And it, it can actually be a lot of a lot of fun. Yeah. And as much as it's like take something from this person, take something from this person. Also, what if you just shut everybody out <laughs> and you just focused on you? Yeah. Oh, that, well, okay. So now that's, that's another key is like, stop listening to other people and start listening to your voice. I think that our inner voice is so much more powerful and it's such a good guide, way better than we give ourselves a lot of credit for. Yes, definitely. And I think, you know, sometimes it's hard to shut those voices out because I mean, don't turn off this podcast, but you know, <laughs> it's, you see so much online. There's so many new books coming out, but I think it's, you know, trying to find A, success stories, which I think are great, but B, you know, are those success stories telling you like this is the exact plan or or are they sharing in a way that is adaptable for you? I love that. And that's why I think your book is so good uh, because it is something that uh, somebody can take from it, mold it, shape it, make it their own, find what works for them and get that success long-term. So the book, Know Your Endo, we will put a link to it in the episode notes or the description below. So go ahead and pick up your copy. Jessica, thank you so very much for your time today. This has been an absolute treat. If you feel like you've raised your health IQ by a couple of points, go ahead and subscribe to this channel and leave a nice comment below. And to hear the entire interview, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your shows from and subscribe to the exam room by the Physicians Committee. And please leave a five-star rating.